Okay. Uh, I have it. It's uh, about a minute after eight. So uh, I'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. This is a uh, regular meeting of the representative town meeting of the town of Darien. Uh, and we're going to call it to order. Uh, first item on the agenda is acceptance of the agenda. Um, without objection, I'd like to make one modification. Um, item uh, 21-6 is not ready. Um, the town pension board has not actually voted to do this. And so until they do, we really can't act on it. So without objection, we'll remove that from the agenda tonight and then we'll put it back on when uh, the pension board uh, makes its determination. Uh, Kate, do we see any objections? Uh, if you have an objection, please raise your hand. I see no hands raised, Seth. Oh, great. Uh, <clears throat> the next. Um, uh, may I interrupt? Uh, for yes. whatever reason, we seem to be looking at the Board of Education. Thank oh, you. Okay. Well, I mean, what I'm looking at is just a screen that says, let's get started. Well, um, I think we're, we're good now. We're back. We're back on board now. Okay. Are we are uh, are we good to go? Yes. Okay. So uh, without objection, I'll uh, accept the agenda as uh, as uh, amended. Uh, next item uh, is uh, approval of the minutes of January 25, 2021. Uh, can I have a, a motion in favor of approval of the minutes? Uh, Cheryl Russell. And a second. Monica McNally. Great. Are there any additions, deletions? Modifications? I see no hands raised. Okay, are we ready to vote then? Would you like me to send a poll question? Yes, that would be ideal. All right. For some reason, I didn't get a copy of that. Of the poll? The poll, yeah. Um, if you're not listed as staff. Oh, okay. Well, would... I got it. I'm staff. Okay. I don't know why, Seth. It should be on your screen. Maybe it's because um, you're presenting. I usually, you know, don't vote. I usually abstain, but. I just wanted to let you, because it could happen to somebody else, too, so I thought I'd... Okay. Okay, the poll's been out for a minute. 87% have voted. It's 99% yes, no, no, no's, and 1% abstentions. Wonderful. Um, okay, the motion passes. Uh, next item uh, on the agenda is announcements. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Lois Schneider, who heads up the technology committee of the rules committee. Just to brief you on, on some of the things that are going on, we're doing a lot of work here to try and make it so that when it comes to the budget later on here in May, uh, we can uh, avoid perhaps having to do roll calls on all of the budget items. We're trying to be able to do it by polling, and uh, it's, not a, it's not plain vanilla. So without further ado here, I'll introduce Lois.
Sorry, Lois, you're unmuted. Lois, you, you're self-muted. Okay, you go. I'm good now. I got it. Thanks. Okay. Um, good to talk to everybody instead of all the emails that we're sending out. Um, the RTM Rules Technology Subcommittee was appointed by SEF to assist with technology issues identified for the RTM in its functioning and support of the town operations. Um, as you can see, we have some more work to do on the technology, but why do we need to register for district info? And, and you've heard us talk about that. We've sent a lot of emails on this. If your number is before your first name, that helps us organize the meeting with respect to minimizing roll call voting, manage the meeting, and simplifying information used by the town clerk's office. This will eventually save a lot of time for all of us. What is the complexity? And this is now underlined. Um, we have learned that we're working with two different pieces of software for committee meetings and a different, different ones for RTM meetings. And also the software functions differently depending whether we're using mobile devices, computers, or iPads. Um, the survey that you've provided us with gives us guidance on some of the devices, and thank you for responding. Um, we have seen that obviously we have more work to do on our scenarios. The one thing that's basic is if when you register for the meeting and you get the initial screen that says, please fill out the form with your name, and if the screen is blank and you're doing it from start, if you put your district before your first district space before your first name there, it carries all the way through. And that's what we're hoping we'll get to. Either it'll happen automatically that way or we'll get there. Um, we have obviously have more work to do. Um, we will update you with more instructions and we apologize in advance if we need to duplicate some requests. Um, we really appreciate your staying with us in this process. Please contact me if you have any questions and ideas. We thank you for your support and understanding. And using electronics effectively in our virtual meetings will end up saving us a lot of time. We're really trying to avoid roll call vote voting. So thank you very much and um, hope we can make this work smoother next time. Thank you. Thank you, Lois. Um, <clears throat> next, I'm just gonna briefly um, introduce Wayne Fox uh, for some uh, just some FOI questions which have come up just to give you a, a little briefing on use of email and exposure to FOI. Uh, Wayne, uh, I, uh, you can uh, go ahead. Wayne, you need to unmute yourself. Wayne, you're muted. We still have a mute problem. He's self-muted. I sent him a text to unmute himself. Okay. I think you're gonna to need to move on. Okay, um, the next uh, uh, item on the agenda is two presentations. Uh, first, uh, I'll introduce uh, Tom Madden. He's the Director of Economic Development for the City of Stanford uh, to brief us on uh, what's going on there. And uh, Thomas, uh, uh, go ahead and uh, proceed. Excellent, Seth. Thank you so much for inviting me. I, I'm sorry I couldn't come last month. I've got a, a fairly quick presentation for you. Uh, it should be up on the screen right now. I can't see it on my phone, but I'm sure everybody's looking at it. No, uh, so we're not. Give me, give me a minute. Um, okay. For some reason, it won't. It's not letting me. 
share it, and I'm the one who has it. Oh. Who's the presenter? What? I don't know. Uh, I'm trying to make myself the present. Hang on a second. There we go. Yay. How's that? Excellent. Perfect. All right. So we'll just go. Uh, so the first slide, if we go to the next slide, the Stanford housing market, we'll just scroll down here. Um, so what I'm going to do is just sort of give you a quick overview of what our housing market is. Oh, I, I think someone needs to mute because I'm getting a feedback here. So Stanford's housing market, um, as you can see, it is the whole area in Fairfield County has just absolutely been on fire since COVID. Um, you know, we've had stagnant house sales, stagnant house prices really for almost three years now. Uh, and as you saw, you know, in the news and what's been happening is the really the exodus out of New York City and the surrounding area. And we've seen uh, probably close to almost 38,000 people move into Connecticut from New York. It's not quite as much as the 61,000 that we saw that went into New Jersey, uh, but still that I'm looking at that, uh, that's pretty good. And just looking at our numbers there, you know, year to date, uh, last year was 8,600 homes that sold in Fairfield County. For 2020, we had almost 11,000, uh, uh, you know, 11,600 homes that were sold. Um, so that right there was a 3,000, uh, you know, basically home increase in the number of sales. We saw the, the medium prices also go up from 450,000 to 536,000. Uh, what's interesting is, is the town of Fairfield and Stanford really led the way in terms of the uh, county in sales. You had Stanford at 941 and you had the town of Fairfield at just over 1,000. Um, but this really has been boding well uh, just for our area. So you're, you're probably going to start to see a lot of new neighbors as we move in. And it's been really good because we started to see more companies look into the area because a lot of the CEOs moved out of the uh, New York City. Uh, just going to the next slide, it's just I, I put a quick one here together just for Market Watch. Uh, this is the 13 year third quarter sales trends, um, you know, dating back to 2008. Uh, so you can see over the last little bit how stagnant it was from the uh, 2013 really to 2018, 19, and then how we just really shot up uh, over the last little bit. And I think, you know, um, with the shutdown and what's happened in New York City, it's, it's really led to the people coming here. A lot of the people we've talked to here in Stanford are absolutely thrilled with, with moving into the area. They, you know, were lifelong residents of New York City, and now they're going, this is the greatest thing ever. Uh, so the next slide. Uh, so just our commercial market. Um, you know, again, we've been really moving, uh, moving everything along. Um, you know, our vacancy rate is still high, but you know, we just actually signed one company to 46,000 square feet. Uh, we should be able to make that announcement in, I'm hoping April with the governor. Uh, but this company has the potential to move out, you know, grow to about 2,000 people here in Stanford. Um, I can tell you ITT, we just took them from Westchester. That is a Fortune 800 company. They are moving their entire C-level suite to Stanford as a complete regrowth, rebranding um, for the company itself. And then we've been watching Point Pickup, which just moved into some of the Marriott space on the 333 Ludlow. Um, you know, they started with 75 people this late fall last year. I believe they're up to about 200 people now just in that company. Uh, and again, we're expecting that company to grow to hopefully about 500 people. Um, if you have kids that are coming out of university, they are hiring right now. Um, and if you want to get in touch with me, I'm more than happy to get in touch with the hiring manager and to connect you <laughs> for jobs with your kids as well as Semaphore, that's our biotech company. They just took over a huge space over on Southfield Avenue, right down by the water. Again, they are hiring like crazy. They cannot find enough people to hire. Again, um, if you've got kids uh, or friends you know, that are looking, uh, we, we've got a lot of jobs that are starting to post now in Stanford as companies start to move in. Um, we'll just go to the next slide. So just the, the COVID impacts. And so this is just really looking at the fall. 
Um, so this curve right here is about half of what we saw back in April. You know, we did flatten that curve very well. Uh, and where we are in Stanford, and this is just our new cases direct from Stanford, uh, we're roughly about where we were right before Halloween. And so we're starting to flatten this out a little bit more. We're hoping this is going to come down over the next three, four weeks. Uh, talking with the state, we're hoping March 1st we'll start to see a few more restrictions lifted uh, as they start to roll out more and more vaccines as well as we get more people inoculated um, and people start you know, going back to wearing their masks, washing their hands, and social distancing. Um, Stanford itself, we are, are setting up several large vaccine sites. Uh, one of them is at the Lord and Taylor site. Uh, we'll have two providers there. We're putting one into one Elmcroft as well. Um, we have Stanford Health as another main one, and then we're working on a fourth site. Um, the mayor is really pushing staff here to make sure that we, we turn into more of a regional center for vaccination so that way we can help out all the towns around us who may not have the capability uh, to be able to vaccinate. And so, you know, when you start to look at some of the numbers, we've been helping out with some of the surrounding towns and getting their 75-year-old uh, population, 65-year-old population. You may have seen from today's announcement that the state has gone to an age cohort model. And so we'll be moving in um, to the 55, 65 over the next uh, week or so, and then into the 45, 55s and moving down into the 16 year olds by uh, May. Um, you know, the reason for this is they just want to get as many people vaccinated and not have to worry about who is an essential worker, who's not an essential worker. Uh, they're going by the numbers on this and they find that, you know, the older people really need to get that vaccination first uh, in order to protect that most vulnerable population. Uh, the state will be moving forward with the teachers, I believe, in the next week. They are trying to get all the teachers. That's one of the things that is absolutely important for our Stanford economy uh, and bringing the corporations back is to make sure that the kids can go to school and it's being done safely. Um, now let's talk just a little bit about what COVID has been doing. So we'll go to the next slide. And this is uh, from the Fed uh, in St. Louis. This is just an overall long-term uh, from 1950s, our unemployment rate for Fairfield County. And you can sort of see the gray bars there is, you know, we had the Great Recession just before the start of 2010. You saw uh, it jump up uh, to almost 10%. Well, we, we beat that pretty good in Fairfield County. Uh, we went up to 15%, but we've actually started to drop down uh, into about 6.3% for Fairfield County. Now, when you actually start to dive into the numbers, and we'll go to the next slide here, uh, it's really the self-service industry that has probably got hit the hardest out of everybody in our area. So when you think about the hairdressers, some of the people working at restaurants, um, anyone providing nail service, things like that, anybody, uh, gyms, things like that, uh, they were, were really self-employed. They got hit the hardest. And so that slide that you're seeing right now is the processed initial claims. Um, so just in the state itself by the industry, you see that self-employed, which we really never counted before. Those are our 1099 employees. Uh, that was probably the hardest hit. And that actually got opened up to allow for unemployment insurance through the CARES Act. Um, then you saw as it moves down construction, uh, administration service report, retail trade, accommodation food services, healthcare. Uh, manufacturing. Now, some of that started to dip when you start to look at those numbers, that little orange bar, red bar, gray bar. As we started to open up uh, parts of the economy and having no guidelines, that's when those initial claims started to drop down because people started to hire again. Uh, as the COVID numbers went back up over Christmas into, you know, really Super Bowl, um, those numbers, you know, people were getting laid back off again, as well as people were, were coming off of unemployment insurance or going back onto unemployment insurance. Um, you know, under the new CARES Act, uh, you know, originally you had $600 for unemployment insurance. Now uh, it's going to go down to $400. But the idea was to really protect the people that need it the most uh, as we start to prime the pump to get the economy going again. Uh, next slide. Um, so initial claims are our hardest hit. Uh, into our areas was really the 40 to 59 year olds, or, or 30 to sorry 59. Uh, that was really our hardest hit. You see the gray bars there. That was the January 3rd. That was the next jump up as people after Christmas when there was layoffs and people were were doing as much shopping and the personal services really declined. 
Um, so now we're starting to see that, you know, come back a little bit to January 10th, January 17th numbers. Um, we're expecting this as we roll into March, April, it gets warmer outside the vaccinations, uh, that will start to drop again. Um, and hopefully we'll get more people employed uh, as we move along and we start to open things up. Now, what's interesting is as we talk to all of our corporations within Stanford, uh, a majority of the corporations have really been waiting until almost April, June to start coming back into the buildings. We have a lot of empty buildings right now uh, with people working at home. You know, Synchrony basically moved to a completely online model. They put computers out everywhere, got everybody high-speed access. You go up to their office space, there's only a few people that are actually in that office space up at 777 on Long Ridge. Um, you look at Hinkle, they're looking to bring people back about a 30% rate uh, starting in April, uh, and they're hoping to be 60% uh, by this summer sometime. And again, that's based on the vaccination rate. Uh, as well as when you look at our financial companies, UBS, RBS, and a few of the other ones, um, they're not planning to come back till September. So as we start to look at the comparisons for those industries, we're going to start to see the unemployment drop as those services in those buildings start to get picked up and people start to uh, purchase goods and services again. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. Um, so again, this is just really breaking down now into race national origin. Uh, again, you know, in our area, uh, it, was, it was predominantly white that got hit. Uh, and then Hispanic, Latino, then Black African American. Again, you look at that gray bar, that January 3rd, that's where we had a lot of initial claims come back in again because things were shutting, shutting down right after Christmas. Uh, next slide. So initial claims, you can sort of see that spike. Uh, I just like to show this one and I'll show you the next one here. Let's go to the next slide, and this is just continued claims. So uh, we've been trying to bring it back down again. Um, so we're still a little bit higher than where we were initially, um, but it will start to come down as, again, we start to open things up. Now, what's interesting on the next slide is I'm doing a little bit of a comparison here. So the dotted lines uh, is from the Great Recession running January 2008 to July 2011. That's sort of the time frame that we've said that is the Great Recession. And you can sort of see the peak uh, in January 2010 of unemployment. It was that slow buildup. Whereas the solid lines that we have for here, for Bridgeport, Hartford, New Haven, Stanford, and Norwalk, you can see that initial spike up for really was March. Uh, and then you start to see the peak and then started to drop down as the governor opened up the economy and brought out the different guidelines. So phase one, phase two, phase three. Uh, and then as we rolled back into a phase 2.1, the claims and everything else started to come back up again. Because again, people were laid off because the restaurants and everything else were curtailed back from being closed at 1 o'clock in the morning to 9.30 at night. So, again, you didn't need as much staff anymore. Again, we're hoping and uh, we're, tra we're tracking this out specifically um, to see where we're going to land. I am hoping that uh, from my predictions and the dashboards we've developed in Stanford, that we are looking at really a recovery coming into um, Q1 of 2022, uh, where we really start to pick everything back up. What's interesting, though, as we go to the next slide, uh, we had a McKinsey do a little bit of a, a study for us, and we looked at the different curves that were out there based on the economic impact of the COVID crisis. Um, ideally, we would like to see like an A4 type curve here, uh, where it's contained, strong growth rebound, uh, but where we're really sitting is an A1, A2 curve, uh, where it's the virus, we had that reoccurrence, uh, but we returned to a trend growth. Uh, so one is a little bit of a muted recovery, one's a strong recovery. What we're finding in Fairfield is our GDP is actually getting very close to where it was right before uh, the COVID um, really when everything got shut down in March. Uh, and we're coming back with a very strong recovery in our area. Um, we're hoping again, based upon what we're seeing, uh, a good solid Q1 coming in 2022 uh, with all the corporations coming back. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. Um, again, this is just uh, some of the study stuff that we brought together. And so you can sort of see here Q4 uh, in 2021. Uh, that is the A2 curve that we are sort of predicting uh, where we'll start to return to pre-crisis level. 
and we're hoping that we would like to be somewhere in there <laughs> between that A3 and A and A1, um, you know, uh, in terms of where we return back to normal. Now, one of the things we're, we're looking at this is really how our prediction is for our own city budgets. Um, you know, last year we predicted that we were probably going to be roughly about $35 million uh, in the hole. We're predicting about $18 million this year. Uh, we are hoping for some additional money as we get the next CARES Act uh, that is being pushed through Congress right now uh, to help fill some of the gaps that uh, we have right here. Um, so we'll, you know, like I said, we've curtailed our services, we've cut a lot of stuff back, um, but we're hoping, like I said, coming back into the next budget season, it's going to be much, much better than what we're looking at right now. Um, my last slide, and this just is sort of explaining everything, is the impact sector falls into sort of three operational models of our office buildings. And so, you know, this is where as you trace back into the unemployment rate and what has been happening, you know, you look at Stanford, it's a lot of financial services, professional services, wholesale, um, you know, that got hit the most. And so when those buildings emptied out, we had our support services uh, really start to drop down uh, and we didn't have the man for those support services. Well, that then trickles, trickles down into the local economy. So our downtown retail trade, our accommodation services, which are Honestly, they're running about 17% occupancy right now, our hotels. So I've got almost 3,000 hotels that are running at 17% occupancy. Uh, you know, they're hurting really bad. And then as well, when you look at the arts and entertainment uh, and the recreation, again, because of the restrictions we have at, say, our theaters at 50% capacity, or if it's a private event, you're limited to 100 people. Um, these are just not big money makers anymore. Um, so again, you know, as we talk to each of the different venues, the retailers and everything else, and we start to work with our companies coming back in, again, we're planning for more social events into the fall. Uh, so we've moved our, our Live at Five concerts already to September, uh, hoping that we get enough people vaccinated, get to that, at least that 60 to 70 percent mark, um, and then be able to start again to open things up. So. Um, I understand this is a little bit different presentation than I normally give because I'd like to run through all the buildings and the companies and everything else. Um, but I, I wanted to really talk to you today about what's impacting Fairfield County and some of the metrics that we've been looking at within the city itself and how that is impacting our surrounding communities, but also our, our corporations and the economy within that. So um, Seth, I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody would have. Nicholas, now's your chance. Unmute myself there. Thank you. Uh, really appreciate it, Tom. Uh, it was uh, brief, but uh, a lot of meat in there. Um, uh, is there um, is there anyone who might have a, a question for Tom? Mr. Branca, you need to unmute yourself. Mr. Branca? Hi there, yes. Uh, this is Nick Branca from uh, District 4. I, I just had a question on, on your graphs on the um, continuing claims there, I, I guess, for the unemployment. Um, yep. You know, obviously, it looked like it, it's come down very quickly, certainly compared to the, you know, the, the Great Recession as you had them overlap. I just had a okay. question about how that works in terms of, you know, are, are people, you know, exhausting their unemployment benefits because it's lasted, you know, a three month or six month period. And, and so they might still be actually unemployed, but just not able to file continued claims or, or not. So it, a lot of it goes into, you, you had people who are basically exhausting their claims. However, it was just re-upped again by Congress. So former President Trump re-upped it. Uh, They're looking to try to extend that out a little bit longer. Um, so that's why you started to see those claims come back in because people were then eligible to uh, reclaim again. And so, like I said, we, we like to track this. We think the curve, like I said, it dropped down quite a bit. It picked back up. Um, again, it's, you know, we're predicting hopefully to get back down to an unemployment rate if you best line it out. Uh, similar to, you know, really January uh, 2022, like I said, as we go into later on this year, 
uh, and getting a little bit further into uh, 2022, we should hopefully, the economy should, we're hoping to be back to normal by then. So um, like, like I said, the, this CARES Act that is coming out from what we're talking to, to uh, Congressman Himes and Senator Murphy and Senator Blumenthal and, and our lobbyists, uh, this will be the last CARES Act. They won't be doing anything else. And so, you know, they're going to try to make this pump, uh, you know, priming the pump as big as possible. Um, and then it's really now getting the vaccination and getting people back into the regular parts of their lives and get them out shopping and, and doing regular stuff. Thank you uh, very much, Tom. Um, anything else? We're ready to move along. Seth, I've gotten a couple of requests to um, send out these slides to the members. Um, the town clerk's office does have them, so we can have them sent out tomorrow. Outstanding. Okay. And Wayne yep. is here if you want to go back to him. Uh, yes, Wayne, thank you. Um, I tell you what I, I might do is is bring David Knopf, let, let him uh, uh, talk about... Uh, have the uh, COVID-19 and the vaccines and Darien, and then uh, uh, we'll uh, move to Wayne. Um, so again, Tom, thank you so much for uh, your contribution. It's, uh, it was quick, but it was very good. Excellent, hey, Seth, thank you so much. And I look forward to actually being in person with you guys next year. <laughs> Great, uh, we, we look forward to seeing you. Um, We'll see you on uh, one of the city webs, huh? Sounds good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, David. Um, David Knopf, Director of Health for Darien, talking about the situation here in town on COVID-19 and the vaccines. <clears throat> All right, thank you, Seth. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good evening. Um, I hope everybody paid attention to the previous um, presentation because there's a lot of COVID information in there that's very relevant to us. Um, Kate, if you could scroll to the first slide, please. I'd like to kind of go over a couple things that are in our weekly report um, that uh, is very important. The first one is the state vaccine program, which describes excess eligibility. Learn when you will be eligible to be vaccinated. <clears throat> well, today, <clears throat> there was an announcement that has great impact on us all, and that is the expansion and eligibility criteria for people to be vaccinated, to include those that are over 55, as well as all the others that had been previously eligible, as well as the teachers and uh, support staff at schools. And the way it was explained in a series of, um, of um, webinars that were um, held this afternoon with the state health department and also with the governor's press conference is, is that local health departments are being charged with primary responsibility for vaccinating teachers and working with the school system. To that end, um, earlier uh, this evening, I had a conversation with Dr. Adley and we've started working on a plan that could potentially get our teachers in Darien vaccinated within by the end of next week, because the eligibility begins on March 1st, and we have an ambitious plan that hopefully could get teachers done, if not next week, then by the end of the following week. Um, but the vaccine program that um, link that's on that page should contain the updates that will begin as of next week and shows a schedule for <clears throat> expanding in the future eligibility for vaccine and it's totally based on age not health underlying health concerns they're not taking into account um, types of workers um, but it's primarily age related and the next phase includes teachers that's a very important um, um, classification and distinction to consider. And it's very different from what CDC is recommending. Next slide, please. And this is kind of an update um, just to show you that <clears throat> we've been working and giving vaccine. Last week, there was a problem with the vaccines. It was in the news weather, and, but we've been able to maintain our clinics and provide vaccine to people 
and maintain uh, all the appointments that people had. We have two clinics scheduled this week, and then uh, we'll be talking about next week when we expand to include teachers. Next slide, please. And again, this shows the trend from the beginning of time. And as you can see, uh, the last week to the right um, pretty much is um, where we were, as the previous speaker said, um, around Halloween, right after Halloween. So, uh, and you got to like the trend for the last one, two, three, four, five, six, seven weeks. Let's just hope it continues that way. Um, that's pretty consistent uh, with what's going on statewide too. Next slide, please. And again, you can see uh, how we've really, um, we have another week to go in February, but um, we're still showing a very good trend here. Next, please. And what we did was we broke down the slides by ages because we were seeing changes in age distribution as this uh, disease has progressed. Um, if you look back to the lower right-hand corner, uh, that's, that's at the beginning of time with COVID. And you could see that the highest rate of occurrence or most number of cases, yes, is in the 50 to 59 age group. And the next, the next one is July 1st to September, the bottom on the left. We had a very quiet summer. And the largest number of cases, the 16 to 20 year old age group, really had to do with um, a couple of parties. So it was, it was a pretty good quiet summer. I don't know if that has something to do with just that everybody was outside, um, but um, anyway, it was, um, it was a quiet summer. Next, to the upper right, once again, the number one age group affected by this um, were the 50 to 59 year olds, but you start seeing a much higher rate of occurrence in the younger kids. Um, if you look to the left of that, you can see those columns, those are those numbers are considerably higher <clears throat> than the excuse me, than they were back in March through June. And again, we that trend continued. If you go to the upper left, you can see again the age ages of of um, positive cases are uh, younger. And <clears throat> in both both time frames, we attribute a lot of that to sporting activities, particularly in the fall, and um, family activities, parties, and get together. Um, that's what we've been finding through our contact tracing and interviews, case case interviews, um, that it's it's uh, a lot of parties and, um, and events, get togethers, and it's really not related to uh, transmission in schools. And that's an important consideration also. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, we've been seeing some hospitalizations and, uh, and, a, and a couple of deaths. But if you go to the next slide, um, you can see that they are, again, concentrated in our higher age groups, which is the focal point for those to receive vaccine. As you know, the very first um, people eligible for vaccine were 75 and above. And you can see that's where the biggest impact on hospitals and, and hospitalizations, anyway, and deaths occurred. It was in the uh, older age groups. So that's where the vaccine has been allocated. And it continues, you know, that you can see that um, it, while <clears throat> the younger kids and that actually the zero to nine that should that should come out. That was uh, that's in there in error. So we don't have anybody that's listed as a hospitalization younger than the 40 to 49 year old category. Next slide, please. So this just shows that over time, 
as testing has become more available, more people are being tested. Um, 8,000 tests were done in January, 265 positive for a positivity rate of 3.3%. Next slide. And this is just to give you an idea of how busy the um, drive-through test clinic has been on Leroy. Um, it's still very heavily utilized. There were over 100 tests done just today. And I'm pleased to say that there were 85 Darien residents who were tested at the drive-through today and zero were positive. So <clears throat> there's good news on a couple of counts. The rates are lower and vaccine is becoming more available. So with that, uh, I don't think there are any more slides. So I'll uh, I'll take any questions. Well, uh, thank you, David. Uh, very concise and yet thorough presentation. You, a few thank slides, you, you can get a good picture of where we are. Um, do, does anyone have a question for David? Mike Wheeler. Okay, Michael. You mentioned, you mentioned uh, parties at one point. Uh, I saw something about grocery stores recently. Although the numbers are down dramatically, what does recent contact tracing show uh, the cases are coming from? In home activities, you know, just people at home. We're seeing a lot of family transmission between family members. Um, it's very, very common these days that what we're seeing is the newer cases are siblings or parents of those who've already been positive. That's that's pretty much that's a that's a common theme right now. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, any others? Wadi Platt. Okay. Yes. Uh, my question is, if you're in the 55 and above class and it says march 1st is the first available date is there a way to register in vans or do we have to wait until march 1st i think you have to i don't think vans will accept your registration until march 1st okay thank you you're welcome great right, thanks uh, laura, anyone... pesci, laura pesci gray okay um yeah I know, David, you mentioned that there were like 85 tests today, and I know a lot of people traveled over the break. And according to the Connecticut Travel Advisory, people could basically test 72 hours prior to coming back to Connecticut, which I feel is a little bit flawed because it's just too soon. Like if somebody was exposed or getting off an airplane, isn't that... Isn't that what is possibly causing like the 85 cases that are negative? It, there's not enough quarantine time. So that's my concern with returning back to school is that that travel advisory is really not thorough. Well, I can tell you that um, I don't know that there are too many public health officials, uh, particularly those of us in local public health, who will disagree with you about that. But that's not our policy. That's the state okay. policy. Great. Well, um, David, I want to thank you very much uh, for uh, for first of all suggesting that we do a little bit uh, each one of our meetings because the the landscape changes so fast. Um, well, I'll say. <laughs> and uh, so uh, here we are today. We'll see where we are in thirty days, right? Um, well, I'll tell you, you know, from lunchtime to dinner time, it changed today. So, <clears throat> yeah, right. That announcement. Yeah. Well, I thank you very much. Uh, those who You're have welcome. further questions, David is very available. You can send him an email or get in touch with him. Yep. So, uh, absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, and what we'll do uh, now is uh, move on and. Uh, Wayne, uh, I understand, is ready. So, Wayne, can you just give us that uh, the FOI thoughts? Go ahead, Wayne. 
Wayne? He's unmuted, but I can't hear him. Seth, I don't think it's going to work. Okay. Um, uh, let's uh, move on. We'll get something out uh, via email. Um, the next uh, item is 21-3. Consideration and action on the newly negotiated contract between the Darien Board of Ed and the Darien Administrators Association. On behalf of the Education Committee, Clara Sartori, Chair. Clara, can you raise your hand? Go ahead. Okay, good. Um, all right, um, this is 21-3 resolution of the RTM meeting of the Town of Darien for consideration and action on a proposed contract between the Darien Board of Education and the Darien Administrators Association. Um, education is a primary reporting uh, group. I, I would like to move the resolution and have your permission to waive the reading. We have a second. Have a second? Yeah, just uh, Adele Conniff. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. Um, the RTM Education Committee met on Monday, February 1st, with 14 of 16 members present to consider the contract between the Darien Board of Education and the Darien Administrators Association. David Deneen, Board of Ed Chairman, Dr. Adley, Superintendent of Schools, Marge Sion, Director of Human Resources, and Rich Rudel, Director of Finance, joined the meeting, as did several Board of Education members. Here are the highlights of the contract. And just so you know, the contract was filed with the town clerk and it will be online once it's ratified. Um, the contract covers 33 administrators for the period July 1, 2021 to June 30th, 2024. It was negotiated in November by a team of Board of Ed members and Mrs. Sion and Dr. Oddly. The process, according to Dr. Adley, was amicable and it reflected a good working relationship between the administrators and the board. There were no significant language changes. Dr. Adley commented that Darien is fortunate to have exceptional leadership, especially this year. This agreement recognizes the ongoing efforts of the building administrators and program leaders. Examples of positions covered in the contract include principals, assistant principals, department chairs, and program directors. The increase is 2% per year in each of three years covered by the contract. The GWI is lower than in the previous contract. The cost to the town of the wage increase is $350,382 or 6.32 over three years with an average of 2.11 per year. The contract includes grandfathering out of insurance buyouts for administrators who waive the insurance coverage for any administrator receiving this benefit as of September 24th, 2020. The health care coverage is a high deductible health plan, uh, an HSA, the, shared pay, the share paid by the administrator for fiscal year 20, 22 and 23 is 21%, which is fairly high in this DERG and fiscal year 24, the uh, percentage is 22%. Uh, there were several questions from the Education Committee and we received the following information at our meeting. Uh, state statute directs what positions are included in the Administrators Association. This is their union. The language that was once in an MOU for department chairs, which were added a couple of years ago, is now in the body of the contract. Article three of the contract provides description for the number of days worked by each level of administration and the vacation days earned. Tuition reimbursement is provided on a scale similar to the teacher contract, the DEA, but is not requested by, administra by administrators as often as by the teachers. A position elimination procedure is described in article eight. The new assistant principals, which will replace the uh, facilitators, 
is covered by this contract and it will bring the total number of individuals covered to 38. And there is a $144,000 difference in moving the facilitators who are now working the schools to APs next year. The contract does provide leave for extraordinary circumstances, but there is no formal sabbatical leave. It describes the methodology, methodology for evaluation of administrators and the health insurance premiums are determined by claim experience. The Education Committee voted unanimously to approve and not to reject the contract which covers salaries, health, and other conditions of employment for the term July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2024, and it asks that the RTM do the same. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Clara. Uh, next, uh, secondary is the Finance and Budget Committee, uh, Jack Davis, Chair. Um, I'm Jack Davis, Chair of the RTM Finance and Budget Committee. I will not repeat the information presented by Clara, Chair of the Education Committee. It was a great report. Um, I do want to stress a couple of things. Um, on all of our contracts, we are not voting to accept, we're voting to not reject. Um, and Clara um, spoke on that, and that's an important uh, distinction. Um, I just wanted to add a couple of quick things. Um, Board of Ed employees not covered by this contract include the superintendent, assistant, and associate superintendents, middle school team leaders, curricular monitors, and elementary teacher leaders, the head of HR, and the CFO. Um, Clara mentioned the work years, vacation, health insurance, and sick leaves. All of those are the same as what were in the prior contract. Um, there was a slight modification to the Board of Ed um, reimbursement tuition, and that is, uh, again, consistent with uh, the teachers. But the change was that some online courses can now be taken with the superintendent's approval. The RTM Finance and Budget Committee met on February 10th and with 14 of 17 members present and unanimously approved uh, this resolution and recommends the same to the full RTM. Thank you, Jack. Um, are there any other committees? I don't okay. see anybody raising their hands. I'm sorry, didn't get that. I don't see anybody raising their hand to speak. Okay. Thanks. Uh, town officials. Okay. Uh, members of the RTM. I see no hands. Um. Okay, uh, I, public. Look good? No, we're good. All right, uh, then uh, are we ready to vote? Ready? Okay, go okay. away. Okay, we're a minute in and 88% have voted. It's 95% yes. We do have some abstentions, 5%. All right, 
Um, it appears the motion passes. Right. We do have a question. Okay. Um, Michael Cortez. Kate, I thought we were voting to not reject, not to be confused with approving it. Is that just a semantics issue? I apologize. I'm the one who wrote the polling question. Um, and I did write it as approve. Um, the The resolution does say the RTM hereby approved. So my thing is, do you approve the resolution? So I think we you are where you want to be. You are, Kate. That's correct. Thank you, Wayne. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Um, next item is 20-1-4, consideration and action uh, on the uh, Board of Education uh, special appropriation of 1.788-130 uh, million for reopening expenses because of COVID. On behalf of uh, the Finance and Budget Committee, Jack Davis, Chair. Jack, you want to raise your hand? Go ahead. <clears throat> I'm Jack Davis, Chairman of the RTM Finance and Budget Committee. I move 21-04, consideration and action on approval of the special appropriation of $1,788,000 $130 to be used to fund the Board of Ed reopening expenditures due to COVID. Do I hear a second? Lisa Yarnell. If there's no objections, I waive the full reading of the resolution. There's two areas I'd like to cover tonight. The first is the process for special appropriations, which I think is important that we cover. The second are the financials associated with the Board of Education special appropriation request and unfortunately this is not as short as the um, administration unit contract report the process for special appropriations is delineated in the ch uh, charter chapter 11 finance and taxations section 40. section 48 states special appropriations may be made by the board of finance when there shall be um, have been an omission in the annual appropriation due to entirely um, to oversight or inadvertence, or when said board shall determine that an actual emergency has arisen after it has made the annual appropriations and the findings of said board as to the existence of such emergency shall be final and conclusive. Goes on to say in 40B, any such special appropriation is required an estimate thereof shall be prepared and submitted to the Board of Finance at a special meeting called for that purpose and said board at such meeting or any adjournment thereof may make such appropriation. Finally, in 40C states such appropriation and the rate of taxation, if any so recommended, shall be submitted by the Board of Selectmen for approval to a regular or special RTM meeting called for that purpose and the representative town meeting may decrease the appropriation or any item thereof or the rate of taxation recommended by the Board of Finance or such RTM um, meeting may vote not to make such appropriation or level such a special tax but in no case shall any RTM meeting have the power to increase any special appropriation or any rate of taxation recommended by the Board of Finance, or so to decrease the rate of taxation to create a deficiency. In section 40C, actually, which is not relevant to the resolution before us, but I think it's important to know that in the charter, um, and it's not appropriate because we're paying this out of general fund funds, but if the Board of Ed, uh, Board of Finance rather, had determined to levy a supplemental tax to cover this or any other special appropriation, 
The RTM has the power and the authority to instruct the Board of Selectmen to pay for the special appropriation instead with notes instead of a special tax levy, providing the notes would cover the special appropriation. And the Board of Finance would issue said notes and the issuance would be submitted for approval at the next annual budget meeting. This is not an authority typically bestowed upon us in the RTM. So I thought that as things are developing during our current budget, that that's an important thing to keep in the back of people's minds. I want to review some of the events that followed this process. The Board of Ed met at the regular meeting on January 26, 2021 and approved their request for a special appropriations in the amount of $2,384,934. Subsequent to their January 26 meeting and before the Board of Finance held a special meeting, an ESSER, that's E-S-S-E-R grant, it was our second, was received in the amount of $596,804, which was applied to the prior amount, reducing the special appropriation requested to the current amount of $1,788,130. In accordance with the charter, the Board of Finance held a special meeting on Thursday, February 4th, and approved the full reduced amount. On February 15th, the Board of Selectmen approved their resolution to to refer the special appropriation to the full RTM, again, as prescribed in the charter sections. And now that special appropriation is before us. So the finances, or as my two-year-old grandson, Ollie, might say, what happened? So for Ollie and the RTM members here tonight, here's what happened. The Board of Finance instructed both the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Ed not to include any COVID-19 expenses in their fiscal year 21 budgets. The Board of Finance gave their commitment, which they um, concurred with, to cover through special appropriation any COVID-related expenses that occurred outside of the budget. Now, for the Board of Education, one of the first things that they did was to create a new core center RC28, in August and September timeframe, to record and account all of the COVID expenses that incurred. As for the expenses, here's what happened. The Board of Ed hired seven classroom teachers at the uh, um, elementary schools for social distancing, part-time custodians to assist in cleaning in addition to the full-time custodians overtime to complete cleaning during the weekends. Contracted cleaning staff was added at both the middle and high school. Contracted cleaning staff was added for weekend cleaning. LPNs were added. Nurses have worked overtime in contract tracing. Four FT campus monitors were added. Two FT technicians were recommended to handle the increase in technology. We were only able to fill one of those positions. Internet speed has been increased. Document camera cables, Chromebook covers, um, ViewSonic and additional devices were added. Zoom software, lunch monitors were added to the elementary schools and middle sex. Additional lunch tables were purchased. Food service operations is forecasted to have a negative balance, which needs to be addressed, and it's that's even with Caldwell's furloughing the majority of their staff. The HVAC systems were evaluated and exhaust fans were repaired. PPE, additional custodial supplies, including microfiber rags and disinfected, were added. Elementary libraries were converted into learning spaces and air conditioning was added. Increase in substitutes, coverage was there when you could find a substitute. And the list goes on and on. And in our report, I give you the website for the last financial report through December that lists these in detail and the amounts associated with it, as well as several of the transfers that have been proposed or affected. They're meeting again tomorrow until we'll have a new report. So what are the numbers? The total expenses incurred by the Board of Ed for COVID is $3,517,035. The Board of Ed has offset some of these costs 
from other RCs by reducing expenses or savings that were done there. And that is $649,993. The Board of Ed has received grants, including ESSA 1, ESSA 2, and another grant totaling $1,078,912, which if you start with the 3.5 million and take away the 650 and the 1 million dollars that I mentioned, we come to the final request of $1,788,130. The RTM Finance and Budget Committee met on February 10th with 14 of 17 members present and unanimously approved this resolution and recommends the same to the full RTM. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Very thorough, as usual. Next, um, uh, secondary is the Education Committee, Clara Sartori, Chair. Hi, uh, I'm Clara Sartori, uh, and I have a report from the Education Committee, uh, which is secondary on this item. Um, the RTM Education Committee met in a special meeting on Thursday, February 11th, with 14 of 16 members present to discuss the special appropriation for $1,788,130 to be used to fund the Board of Ed's reopening expenditures due to COVID. David Deneen, Board of Ed Chair, Dr. Alan Adley, Superintendent, and Rich Rudolph, Director of Finance, joined the meeting, as did several Board of Ed members. Mr. Deneen referenced many spreadsheets describing the materials and staff included in this requested appropriation. In addition to grants, the Board of Education has realized some savings from programs canceled and has made transfers within their budget. Unexpended funds are returned to the town at the end of the year. The Board of Ed's original request as Mr. Davis explained, was for an appropriation of $2,384,934. This was reduced when they received notice of a grant of $596,804. Clara, we're getting heavy. Yeah, I hear it. Uh, does that help? Does that help? No. Clear, it's Sorry. coming. It's coming from how? From how? It's coming from what? Coming from what? You. You. How about that? How about that? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yeah, we're still getting the we're echo. Still getting the echo. Can you turn your speakers turn down? Your speakers down. Okay, I don't have much less to do. Um, is that any better? Is that any better? No. no. It just started. Okay, I'm just trying to finish then. Um, the, board of, the Board of Ed's original, yeah, request, original request, I told you that, in response, that, to, the response to the committee's questions, questions the following comments were made by the administration the Board of Ed Chair. In all, the Board of Ed has received more than a million dollars in grants and grants and state, and state expenses were for people for people supplies, technology, technology, and some staff for social distancing, nursing support, and tech assistance. Each town's allocation is listed on supporting documents. Funding formulas follow town allocations. So allocations given by town. The grant of $596,804 is definite. The portal will be opened and ritual will submit expenses against the grant. The Education Committee voted unanimously to approve and authorize the appropriation of $1,738,130 to fund the Board of Ed reopening expenses due to COVID and suggest that the full RTM do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Adele. Adele. I believe the problem is that you are logged on on two different devices.
Sorry, I, 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 I meant Clara. Clara. I meant Clara. Sorry. Sorry. The echo is coming from something else. Something else. All right, let's see if, is that better? That is definitely better. Okay, Seth, you okay. have control again. All right. We do have a raised hand and um, I guess two raised hands. We do? Well, um, I'll, I will, I so. I'll get to everybody. No, I'm uh, sorry, first... questions. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Um, We'll, we'll first of all just check. Uh, we've had a report from the Education Committee. Are there any other committees that wish to report? Any town officials? Any town officials? Hang on a second. Uh, we have Monica McNally. Oh, uh, okay. But, Monica, you need to uh, unmute oh, yourself. Is she speaking on behalf of Public Works, or? I don't know. Monica? Okay. Oh, no, sorry. I wanted to know what the education committee vote was. Gary? Go ahead, Clara. Okay, it was unanimous. Thank you. Did you oh, hear that? Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, I'll start. I'll just go back. Any other committees? I see no hands. Cla uh, Clara has uh, her hand. Clara, no, she was, that um, was so she could, we could find her to answer the question. OK. Uh, members of the um, um, town officials? Okay. Uh, members of the RTM. I don't see any hands raised. All right. Members of the public. No. Okay. We're uh, ready to vote. Go ahead and okay. poll. We have 94% um, have voted, 99% are yes, one abstention, 1% 1 abstention. Okay, um, uh, the motion passes. The next uh, item uh, is 21 5, consideration and action on the town code regarding membership of the Monuments and Ceremonies Commission. Uh, Primary and sole committee is TGSNA. Uh, Frank, Frank Kemp, chair. 
Uh, good evening. I'm Frank Kemp, chairman of the RTM Town Government Structure and Administration Committee. Uh, I would like to move uh, resolution 2105, which is consideration and action on town code change require regarding membership of the Monuments and Ceremonies Commission. Do I hear a second? Jim Cameron. Very good. If there are no objections, I wish to waive the full reading of the resolution. The Monuments and Ceremonies Commission consists of 15 members charged with establishing guidelines for new monuments and maintaining existing monuments, organizing public patriotic parades, public celebrations, anniversaries, and special community events and other tasks, such as the Committee to Recognize Darien's Bicentennial. Quite frankly, as soon as you might look into the activities of this commission, you'll be impressed by the diligent work and dedication to duty that the active members invest. Indeed, indeed, they are invested and give back to the town in very large measure. Unfortunately, the commission is challenged in attracting new members, although the personal rewards of such significant public service are enormously satisfying. The current membership of the commission, as specified in the town code, is 15. This has presented a burden to the commission, but has not to date impeded it from fulfilling its mission. The chairman of the commission and the commission has requested that the size of the commission be reduced to nine, which will make a quorum easier to achieve and the activities of the commission to proceed without delay. The TGSNA committee reviewed this request and the resolution that we have before us this evening and found that the request is in order, having confirmed the request with the chairman of the commission. TGSNA met on February 16, 2021, with nine of 10 members present and unanimously approved this resolution and recommends the same to the full RTM, respectively. Submitted, Frank Kemp, Chairman of TGSNA. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Very nice. Um, are there any other committees who wish to report? I see no hands raised. Uh, town officials? Don't think there are any here. Uh, members of the RTM? Uh, Jim Cameron. Jim? Thanks, Seth. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Great. Um, Monuments and Ceremony is a wonderful committee because uh, I actually watch a lot of their meetings for obvious reasons. I'm just wondering if Frank could tell me what the current membership numbers are now and if that exceeds the number of nine as proposed in the resolution, what will happen to existing members? Thank you. Uh, Jim, I believe that the membership is nine at the moment. Thank you. Um, others from the RTM? No hands raised. Um, <clears throat> any from the pu public? Yep. Okay. Sounds like we're ready to vote. Uh, proceed to poll.
Okay, 96% have voted. It's 98% yes, and there's an abstention. Thank you. Uh, the motion passes. Um, item 21-6, we will take up at a later date. Um, can I have a motion to adjourn? Oh, let's see. <laughs> Jenny Schwartz. There you go. Do I have a second? Mark Adeletta. Okay. Do the poll. All right. Somebody has voted no. Ninety-eight percent yes, two percent no. Motion, the motion carried. The motion carries. The meeting is adjourned.